it's time to welcome to the show Evelyn Kung, who is the clinical director for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, and an amazing person, an amazing clinician, and really a gift to our children. Oh, so thank, thank you, you so much. And I said that, and then as soon as I said that, I thought, well, that that's like leaving out all the teens and the adults that you work out. So that you're a gift to our community. Thank you. How about that? Uh, thrilled that you're here, and thank you for filling in on short notice. We love when you're able to do that. It no really problem. makes it fun. Okay, so we do like to give a little disclaimer at the start of the show that uh, we have amazing experts on the show, and Evelyn Kung is certainly an amazing expert, but there is no expert in any format uh, similar to this that can give individual specific advice. So when you're writing in, please be as specific as you possibly can and know that Evelyn's going to give you information of a general nature to help you to make the next decision about where to go and who to talk to really is what it is. It's like a step on the decision tree, but really helpful. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> I hope I can be helpful. <laughs> okay. I'm going to jump right in with some questions. Uh, hi, I'm emailing from Florida. My six-year-old daughter is extremely bright and just really struggles with sensory, sensitive to touch on head and feet and loud environments, but refuses headphones and is extremely defiant and gets very physical. She hates and gets offended by all behavior reward programs and any type of praise. As soon as she realizes there is a plan to change her behavior, she will not participate and gets very angry with you. So much anger. What can we do? She has a lot of challenging behavior in the classroom and at home, and thank you very much. This is a tough one, right? Yes, okay. it definitely is, but it's very common. So the new um, Diagnostic Manual for Autism actually includes sensory for the first time. Not a good thing. We've seen it for you know the last 20 years, but it was always something that was a side diagnosis or a side issue to deal with. But for the first time now, with the new ASD diagnosis, the whole sensory aspect is a part of this diagnosis now as so many kids display the behaviors. So one of the things you have to realize is when kids have sensory issues and they're really hypersensitive to touch and noise and everything around them, it means their whole time they're alive, something is assaulting them, mm -hmm. you know? And if you had something assaulting you every moment that you were awake, you would be angry at the world too. And we, I think we all forget that. Yeah. Because for us, the sun is not a big deal. It's not too bright. If, or if we hear a sound and, you know, that's down the hallway, it's not a big deal because, yeah, there are sounds everywhere around us. But for these kids, when they're hypersensitive, that means everything is just hitting them all at once, all the time. And if she has multiple areas of sensory hypersensitivity, then it's even worse because it's the light, it's the noise, it's the, how my clothes feel. It's just everything about me is not regulated, is not comfortable, and I'm constantly going to be irritated. And to the outside world, we're going to say, hey, you're, you're an angry kid. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because they're not feeling good and there's something wrong with their body and they just can't handle it. So we have to understand that perspective and have that empathy for them. But in the same light as a parent, um, you know, I know, you know, actually one of my typical kids has some sensory issues and I could see what it is. But I was able to see how a typical child managed sensory yeah. versus our children on the spectrum. And I think that the, it was a really big eye-opener because my child didn't have this until after she had a concussion. Wow. So it was afterwards that I realized, oh my goodness, this is how you handle it and this is how you get through school. And she had the smell and the light issue after a concussion. And it was, I mean, for her, she has perfectly appropriate language and social skills. So when something would start to bother her, she knew she could be in a classroom and she could see the teacher teaching, and at the right time, she would be able to go up to the teacher and say, hey, I'm having a problem right now because I could smell the gas from outside on the street. Yeah. There's a car, and it's really starting to bother me, and I feel like I'm going to vomit if I have to like smell. Can I please close the window? Can I put down the blinds? Can she could actually tell the teacher and give all the teacher all the reasonings for how she's right. feeling and what she needs to change in her environment that was within what was appropriate within that environment. Yeah. And I mean, when you think about how many skills she had to be able to do that, first, 
she could notice and identify what was going on instead of just being stuck in the emotion of I'm uncomfortable. Yes. She was able to identify it for herself and then able to communicate it to her teacher. At the right time. At, so it and required the, social yes. cues that are for them. Yeah, that's, that's a huge big deal. And, and for our kids, that would be... It's 10,000 steps right. to get to there. Yeah. And so when I look at this person, I think, okay, first of all, you need a really good sensory integration assessment by a good occupational therapist who specializes in kids with, kids with autism and on the spectrum so that they can really assess what it is that is you know, hypersensitive. And for some kids, it's hyposensitive where they don't feel anything. And so it's like, go get a really good OT assessment that will tell you exactly like, what is bothering her the most and get priorities. Like what bothers her the most is you know, the light, or what bothers her the most is tactile, yeah. whatever it is. So get a really good assessment, and then you need a really good OT to learn how to give you um, ways to handle it in your home and in the school. Yeah, and um, it can be very different in those two scenarios, Yeah, it right? can be very different, and it might be very different from the beginning of the day to the end of the day to the middle of the day, in the classroom versus on the playground versus in the auditorium versus in the cafeteria. There's a lot of things that they need to, you know, you need information on. And, you know, the area of occupational therapy is, you know, especially when compared to the behavior and analytic world, it's just soft on science. Mm -hmm. There's just not a lot of research on it. And, but we know that it's an issue yes. because we have these kids in our, you know, centers all the time. But there's just not a lot of science. So you really, this is where it really is beneficial to get the really good SI assessments from a really good OT that actually works with the kids on the spectrum. Yeah. Because they can do things that will help, you know, learn to help the kids desensitize the behavior. And it might be small increments at a time that you can't see. Overnight, light is not gonna be okay for the child if they're really hypersensitive to light. If noise is bothering them, they're, you know, just giving them headphones is not gonna plan because just maybe even the tactile feel of headphones is gonna be a problem. Yeah. For a lot of our kids, we teach them, it's a slow process, it's like, I need you to wear headphones, you say, I think this will help you. And we look at it from a behavioral perspective yeah. and we say, we're gonna teach you systematic desensitization and to the point where you're gonna able to um, get the reinforcement from wearing headphones that blocks out that noise that is so offensive. Right, but that's a process in and of itself yeah, to get them to that point. Because just getting to the point of getting them to put headphones on and be okay with that feeling of it, you're not even addressing the sound issue yet. Right. You're just addressing how does it feel on me. Right. And if this child does have all of that hypersensitivity, you just have to fit, hit one thing at a time. You just really need to work through and desensitization, give her enough reinforcement in whatever way it is. And she, it says that she refuses all behavior program. Um, she gets offended by types of praise and rewards program. A lot of that is because it's offending something else. It's punishing her in another way. Like if a kid really has hypersensitivity, you can't yell, yay, because that in itself is very offensive, the yeah. sound of it. The words are intention and the intent that we give is probably good. But if our child has a social a cue or language, you know, difficulty, they're not going to recognize that your intention is good because yeah. intentions are way down the line. Well, even, you know, I remember when Jem was littler, if, if a therapist said, yay, that was okay for him, but there was something, I think because I carried him in the womb and I talked to him all the time, the sound of my voice saying yay is like nails on a chalkboard oh. to him. And it still kind of is, he sort of learned how to mitigate it, but he does not like it when I get loud. He prefers it if I keep things on an even, even keel. So, you know, I think it's important for us to realize that, that their, what is rewarding to them isn't what necessarily is rewarding to us. And if you have a child with multiple levels of sensory hypersensitivity, um, the delivery is important. Yeah. You know, and if you have a child who is constantly irritated by all these sensations, they don't want anybody to change their behavior because it's going to be offensive because they, whatever, you know, on their own system, they want control because they know they can control all these things to keep it away from them so that they're feeling at least okay. Yeah. So the idea of somebody coming in and trying to give them to change without any idea maybe yeah. of the, you know, other issues they're dealing with, it is offensive. Yeah, it is. And, th and then you have the ASD part where a lot of our kids like control and they like routine and that becomes a function of a behavior. Uh, you know, in the behavior analytic world, a lot of people will say control is not a function. But in reality, if you look at people every day, some people want control. Yes. 
and they want to know when things are coming. And, it, and if, if they are having very little control of their world, especially if their senses are constantly getting assaulted, they're going to try to put that control in as much as they can yes. because it protects them. Yes, it's an anxiety thing. Yeah, it creates tons of anxiety. <laughs> so, I mean, there's so many layers here. It's, you know, you really have to go through and figure out what all those, the sensitivities are and then try to figure out how you can desensitize one at a time. Okay, so in the best of all possible worlds for this individual, having the ABA team work on some systematic desensitization along with an OT who's mm -hmm. assessed and said, here's you know, what's really sensitive and being mindful of that and picking what to work on, that's the ideal situation to do this. Yeah, collaboration between your, your sensory integration person and your ABA home therapist is ideal because then you're going to provide the consistency across environments too and maybe... Um, ABA people are really good at breaking large steps into smaller steps so that you're not just coming in and suddenly trying to change her behavior or change her sensitivity. You're doing little steps at a time so that she's able to accept little, you know, not, her whole world isn't going to be rocked by you know, trying to create a huge change. And, and so we've already said what the perfect world scenario is, but uh, you're in Florida, which sometimes it's not the most perfect world yet in Florida. They're working on it, but they're not there yet. So if you don't have access to an ABA team, you should have access at six years old to an OT. Whether it's a really good one, I don't know, but your school should have access to an OT and, the, and she can make a request for school to do an assessment of sensory. You can accept a lot of, um, you just have to know the difference between a occupational therapist in the school setting and an occupational therapist in a clinical setting. Yeah. Because a lot of schools put restrictions on the OTs in the school setting, saying that whatever they put into place has to be academic based. Right. That's why you have so many OTs, you know, working on their pencil grass is because that affects what kind of work they can do. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times the di districts do put some kind of restriction on and you may or may not know. Right. You know? You can fight those. I mean yeah, we've you had can fight people those. fight those because there is a part of FAPE that talks about preparing them for after school which, so that you can make an argument for social things and occupational things, but it's another fight while you're having to deal with this. Yeah. But uh, I, I know one uh, OT who has written some really good books that I really recommend, and that's Kara Kaczynski. We've had her on the show before. She's called The Pocket OT, and if you look her up, she's got some good things. She even has some um, CDs for sound desensitization, okay. which is really cool. Uh, so I would recommend that if you don't have access to somebody, but try. Best case scenario is that you get an OT in your area. Yes. That's really good at this kind of thing. Yeah, and good with this population. Yes. Okay, we should take a break, and then when we come back, we've got more questions, and you can write your questions in right now in the many different formats that we have. Stick with us. Hi, guys. Welcome back. For the month of May, I thought it'd be really neat if we made our own bird feeders. What's cool about it is once it's done and it's hung in your front yard, backyard, balcony, or whatever outdoor area that you have, your kids will be able to observe the bird feeder and tap when they see birds coming over and feeding from it. Like, oh my gosh, oh, so exciting. Do you see that? Sorry, I got distracted. I'm just so excited about all the different birds I've been seeing now that I have a bird feeder hanging outside. Anywho, let's get started. The materials you'll be needing are two and a half cups of bird seed, half a cup of boiling water, two packets of unflavored gelatin, a spatula, twine, scissors, wax paper, and cookie cutters. All right, now that I got your materials, it's super easy. I have my boiling hot half cup of water and I'm gonna take my two packets of unflavored gelatin and I'm gonna pour them in and stir it. The reason I pour it in the water first all by itself is to make sure that the gelatin dilutes really well and I can stir it up real nicely. Now that it's been all stirred together, I'm going to take this liquid and pour it into the bird seed, making sure to scrape up all the gelatin that we diluted. Now I'm just going to stir it all up. Okay, now that this is all mixed up, I'm going to take my wax paper and put it on my table just so I don't make a mess. And then I'm going to take my cookie cutter and lay it down. 
I'm also gonna take a piece of string and cut it, you know, about six inches long. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fill the cookie cutter halfway full with our bird seed mixture. And I'm gonna take my string, fold it in half, I'm gonna place it in the center. This way you can hang this up once it's done and dry. Okay, now that it's full, I'm just gonna pack it in. So now that this is all compacted, it's gonna take about six hours for the gelatin to get completely hard. If you take it out too soon, the whole thing's gonna fall apart. So let's wait a little bit and I'll see you guys in a few moments. All right, it's been six hours now. So let's see if this little guy worked out. So I'm just gonna pull him up and pop him out, okay? And here's my finished bird feeder. All you have to do now is hang it outside and wait for all the great things you're gonna see. Like, oh, ooh, I see another bird. This is so exciting. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the activity and keep me up to date with all the different birds that you and your child see outside your property. Until next time, craft on. Bye guys. Can you see me? Can you see me flying by your side? Welcome back to Autism Live. We had a mom who wrote in as we were talking about sensory issues and, and she said, OMG, I, I have had sensory issues as a kid and still as an adult. Imagine sensory issues for my ASD kiddos. And she says they are, they are still struggling in public and at home. And I, I will admit to being a little bit of a hypochondriac and somebody says something, I'm like, well, I have, I think we all have a little bit of that where we see ourselves in those things. But I have a lot of sensory issues myself. And I have, I have sort of half kidded before that, you know, I think, well, I always like to say that our, our kids don't, uh, ap apples don't fall fr far from the tree and <laughs> uh, puppies don't have kittens. Um, th that's the phrase that a lot of people use in the autism spectrum. But it's interesting to me that my sensory issues are the complete opposite of my kids' se sensory mm. issues. That um, Jem is fine. He can be in a place where it's just... For instance, a high ceiling, lots of noise coming at him from everywhere, and he feels just fine during it. But when the noise stops, uh -huh. that's when he has a problem, and you really have to let him be for a few minutes to process. Now, I'm the opposite, and I, I always find it funny when we go someplace with another autism family. Uh, there was one party that I think of always that we were in this huge gymnasium, where they train like Olympic athletes, but it was a birthday party, right? <laughs> so there was trampolines and there was noise and there were lights flashing and kids jumping and, and echoey noises, this very high ceiling, lots and lots of noise. And a, another autism mom and I were, were standing there and the other child was like really having a problem. And, and the mom was saying, I'm not sure what the issue is. I was having a problem. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, I, I know what it's like for me. As soon as we went into the party room, which was a little close quarters, it was a, a, a lower ceiling, mm -hmm. so the noise wasn't echoing so far, that kid and I were okay. The floor was sticky in that room, and we had to be there in socks, and the floor was sticky. So my son and the other mom were like, I can't handle it. I've got to get <laughs> out of here. i got to get out of here. And I just thought how interesting it is that we were all reacting to the sensory things. It's just different things were pushing different people's mm -hmm. buttons. Yeah. That's sort of common, though, right? Yep, it's common. But it doesn't mean that we have sensory processing disorder. It's just maybe we have a little bit more insight into a small amount of what our kids are going through. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, as typically developmentally functioning people, we know how to, you know, combat it. You know, yeah. we know how to make what we need so that we're okay. We, we have that problem-solving ability. Yeah. And a lot of our kids don't have the problem-solving ability. Yeah. And that's the big part that's missing is it's very difficult to learn how to figure out, like, how do I make myself okay here? Yeah. You know, and they can't do that. They haven't learned how to do that. I, I remember years ago, my mother went to Branson, Missouri, and my, my mother loved to quilt. And she went into the, this ginormous quilting store in Branson, Missouri that had everything in the world. And she couldn't wait to go there. She'd see pictures of it online. But she walked in, and she almost immediately turned around and walked back out. Mm. And I, and I said to her, what happened? And she said, it was just too overwhelming. I just couldn't do it. And I knew I couldn't do it, so I turned around and walked out. And then, you know, a few years ago, when we heard about Romario Snow, that he was in a store, 
and there was something happening that he couldn't deal with in the store. And he didn't just walk out of the store, he ran out of the store and ran for hours. They didn't find him for 27 days. Wow. That's sort of the difference between somebody saying, I can't handle it, and finding what to do, and somebody who has no ability to know what to do about it. Yeah. It's drastic. Yeah, I mean, it's completely non-functional, and safety and other oh. so many other issues come into play. Horrifying, horrifying. All right, so, um, but thank you for writing in and saying that you also have sensory issues. Um, okay, so somebody writes in and says, hello, now that the weather is nice, I really want to work on being able to take my two children to the park. My four-year-old has moderate to severe autism and is nonverbal. He will not walk with me. As soon as I take him out of the stroller, he runs away. When I try to get him to play at the park, it doesn't last and he just starts running again. If I try to put him back in the stroller, he kicks and cries. It's always such a disaster and then my younger one has to leave the park when he's staying with me. How on earth can we work on this vital skill? Our park is not fenced in, but the one at school is and thanks so much. This totally sings to me because I, you know, I do a talk and I talk about the fact that we became so shut in when my son was three years old because we could, same thing, we couldn't take him anywhere. He would run and he would run for the parking lot or the street. And, and I said, we, we started to look like vampires because we didn't go out. <laughs> and, and it makes your life very small yes. and it makes you feel like you're never going to be able to do things that other people can do. Yeah. I do want to say to this mom that now I can, I can go to a park and I can watch him walk away from me and I know it's all good. And you know what, back when he was four, if somebody could have promised me that, I would have cried because I didn't believe that that was ever gonna happen. So now I'm gonna turn it over to you, Evelyn, and you, and you tell us how we get there. But it's possible, I <laughs> yes, know it's possible. it's possible and we do this with our kids all the time, every day, you know, teaching them um, not just the rules, but really it comes down to compliance. That really is what it comes down to. When we're first starting um, therapy in ABA, the first thing we always tell all, all our therapists, supervisors, everybody knows is the first thing you work on with a child is compliance. Because if they're not listening to you, they can't stop to learn. You know, If you're the one chasing them the whole time, they are in chasing mode, they're not in learning mode. <laughs> you know, and they're not figuring it out. So compliance is really the core of the issue here. The core is, will they listen to you when you're in the same room? Will they walk with you when you're in the same room? Will they come to you when you say, come here? Will they come to you within the same room? And a lot of times in therapy, we call it compliance training, is just teaching the kids really basic commands. Come here, sit down, stand up, let's go, and just you know walk with me. Those are all compliance issues. And if they're not doing it in your one room in the home, they're not gonna be doing it at the park. And you start with a really small place, you teach them to come, and that when they come, they get some kind of reinforcement for it. And then you make the space a little larger. So not only are you 10 feet away from me now, now you're across the room. Now you're in another room, and you're able to come, whether you see me or don't see me. You're, now you're in the backyard, and you can come from me from anywhere in the backyard. And then now when they're outside in the front of the home and you're inside the home, you know, that you can call them and they'll come in from outside. Yeah. You know, there's like, you have to build towards the park. Yeah. And we talked to um, all of our staff about one of the reasons um, that we have a team of staff is that the kids start to learn compliance um, across people. Generalization is really important so that they're only not only listening to the one person in their life and no one else. They understand that come here from whoever it is, is they need to come. And it's spreading it out. So it's working on the compliance, having them understand that if I hear my name, I need to look at the person who's calling yeah. or give some indication that I heard them and I know that you want me to come to you. And you just build how, you know, that compliance has to go far. And I used to joke with families. The, when I was a therapist, I remember just telling um, a therapist, another, a new therapist and a new parent saying, yeah, if I, you know, I'm working with this kid and they're like, how come he just comes from wherever he's at? And I said, it's almost like that invisible stick, the cane, to drag them back in. Right. You know, so a kid can be running and if I know I have compliance, I can just yell no or stop. Yes. And the kid just stops. Right. <laughs> and at least they'll turn around and look at you like, what do you want me to do? 
And um, and at schools, they used to laugh and say, it's like you had that invincible cane where you right. would just stop them from far away. Right. And it's like, come here. And they would come back. You it's know? that Wonder Woman thing. Yeah. She's got the lasso, yeah. right? Yeah, it's like I got you from somehow, and I don't know, just by hearing your voice. But it was a lot of practice and repetition and starting in a small environment and slowly building to that bigger environment. And also, if I could add on to it, that knowing that nothing bad is going to happen when they do listen to you, that that's a big component of it. That, you know, it isn't just, for the longest time there was that whole tiger mom thing mm -hmm. about, well, you know, my kids will comply. But what we see is that that kind of compliance, the kids grow up and then they don't, they don't follow what it was that they were taught. They're just complying for the moment and the minute that the parents are out of the house, forget it, all bets are off, right? Yeah. That's not the kind of compliance that we're looking for, but there's a trust that's built because I know people are going to write in and say, but if we, if we teach them compliance with everyone, then they're fodder for the bad people. And that's not what this compliance is. Yes. It's because alongside this compliance, you're teaching safety rules about we don't just go walk, walk we're, we're teaching levels of friendship so we don't walk up to people we don't know and sit on their laps. We don't talk to strangers unless somebody else has said that it's okay. You know, all of those things. So it's compliance with the people that they trust, and they trust them because nothing bad happens. Yeah, and that's the whole of the reinforcement aspect. They learn, initially, people say, well, I don't want them to come to everybody. Right. But initially, they have to know that if they come, something good's going to happen. Right. They receive something good. And a lot of times, if you're a parent, it's just a hug. Right. You know, it's just like just the hug and the touch and just being able to say, you know, give them some love. Yes. And um, so for parents, the kids are a lot of times are so happy to come if they know that they're going to get something good and they yes. know it's you. Exactly. And so then when you go to the park, you do have to teach them walk with me and you practice walking with you and you might not start at the park because there's so many enticing things. You start in a place that's relatively boring and they have nothing to run to. <laughs> yes, that you're yeah. more exciting yeah. and that you're holding something more exciting than what they would run to. I want to say too that there's a wonderful episode of The A Word where they there's a Jack Riley will not walk with his mom outside. He wants to run and if you think about it, why wouldn't he? Yeah. It's so much easier to see it in somebody else's child. We get all emotional and go, my kid won't hold my hand and I remember what that felt like. But I'm, I'm watching Jack Riley and the parents are so upset about the fact that he won't listen to them. They do a social story for him about what the rules are and, and they take him outside and you see him trying to bite his mother's hand because oh. he does not want to hold her hand. But they work what the behavior intervention plan was and they show you the whole thing and then he learns, oh, if I walk and hold hands, I get to be outside longer. I get to do the thing I want longer, and it's all fine after that. Yeah. Uh, and they kind of condense it into a very small thing, but it's really worth watching, and that's on our A word. That's great. I mean, if you can watch the whole process, then that's going to give you hope. At least you know it it, there's little snippets of it. I mean, obviously, they don't, they don't have the time to show all, you know, the whole thing, but they show sort of the steps of it, and, and you see him getting better at it. and you see the frustration of the dad because uh, at one point it you know they have to go back inside because he wasn't following the rules and he's upset and dad's upset and uh, but you see them work through all of that and it can be a really good thing. Yeah and you say that you know the schoolyard is fenced in and the park is not fenced in you you have to be smart about where you're practicing. You start with, you know, inside the home where it's confined, the backyard where it's confined, the front yard where it's open, but you have some, you know, uh, ability to bring them back in, and you slowly go towards the neighborhood. And I wouldn't go to the open park first, but I would go to the fenced-in one just in case he does decide to bolt and, you know, yeah. that he can't get hurt, you know. Yeah, just safety. Safety is a big issue. And just learning the kids, there's a lot of, you know, stranger awareness that we teach the kids just for safety. You know, you don't go to people you don't know, you don't take things from people, you don't go climb on people that you don't know. And it gets really confusing. Um, I remember my two-year-old, when she was two, we had come out of a hospital, and I think I was pregnant. Uh -huh. And there was an old woman who fell down in front of me. Oh. It was not good. And um, so I ran over to help pick her up. And I remember my two-year-old asking me, like, do you know her? Oh, like she yeah. was trying to figure it out. So even a typical two-year-old, she was like, do you know her? Why did you help her? Like, why did you hold her hand? You right. told us we're not supposed to, you know? Right. Like, I, and this is just a typical child being able to, you know, there's so many rules. And she was just trying to figure it out herself. And I just yeah. think, well, you know, we expect our kids just to know. And 
you know you're teaching typical kids along the way you know yeah. and it's the same kind of rules you wouldn't let a child just run off to the swings at a park if you didn't know that typical child was going to listen and stop and yes. come back to you absolutely and so you're giving you're teaching it it's just that you have to be more intentional in teaching our kids with asd as opposed to our typical or neurotypical kids where you are teaching them but it's not so intentional yeah you're just doing it as it goes along and they learn and they pick it up yeah, they, and they pick figure it, it out exactly yeah they pick it up and you're not having to say okay I have to teach this next this next and going by the steps but there is a way to do all this and if you really work on that compliance and being able to come and realize that I can listen to you and good things happen and there's you know and as they become more communicative to tell you what they want you can respond to them about when they can go and what they can do and you know there's a lot of that relationship that's built there where they know that if I go to the park mom will let me go up on the swing will let me go on the slide you know will let me do these things as long as if I call if she calls my name I come back to her yeah. I remember feeling like it took forever like in the in the process of it it feels like it takes forever and it feels like your life is never going to be better and then all of a sudden one day you notice that your kid is the kid who listens and the other kids aren't I still crack up if we go to the pool because we have a pool in our neighborhood that's for our neighborhood and, um, you know, I had very good card therapists who taught me how to, you know, tell him, okay, you know, it's in five minutes we're getting out and give the countdown. And over the years, the countdown got less and less. Um, but that I would say, okay, time's up and it's time to get out of the pool. And the rest of the moms then would go, oh, okay, it's time to get out now. And, and their kids wouldn't get out yeah. and they'd have to get in the pool to get their kid out. And they would go, how did you do that? How did, and, and, and I would just simply say, it's a series of steps. It's not rocket science. It's a diff, it's behavior science. <laughs> it's a series. And he knows that if he gets out of the pool and listens the first time, he's gonna get something, we're gonna go home and he's gonna get a juice popsicle or something that is gonna make it worth his while. Mm -hmm. And that that's when all the party lights come on, when he does what I've asked him to do, all the good stuff happens. And that when he doesn't, that stuff doesn't happen. It's not that it's punitive or I'm gonna stick them in time out or in the corner or something, but the juice popsicles don't come out. Yeah, and the, our kids learn the idea of missing out really easily. Yeah. Because they're so used to the reinforcement, they know that they'll get something for, you know, coming. And it can be anything from the hug to the juice box to, you know, if you, whatever it is. And, um, but then they also know that if they don't do it, yeah. it can just go away. Or right. not be available and maybe next time when we try this it'll come out again yeah. and that I, I always the value of missing out it changes their behavior yeah. they don't want to miss out right. and especially if you have siblings who there's some comparison well the ones that have siblings don't ever want to miss out. right <laughs> right because who would who want would want to miss mm -hmm. out okay we're gonna take a break and then we'll be back with more of your questions stick with us Say hello. S say hello. AJ. Stop crying. <laughs> AJ, let's eat. Can you eat, AJ? Let's eat, son. Have a fry. My understanding of autism was very limited. <laughs> on cars, windows, you, you name it. And so we went to the 13 month checkup and I remember our pediatrician, he said, well, he probably has autism. There's nothing you can do about it. Come back in a year when he's three. Our initial understanding of what the ABA program was, was basically all we picked up from this clinic in San Antonio. He didn't pick up any signs the entire eight months that he was there. I think the difference came when we changed fenders. We were very impressed with the way that CARD actually gathered data to be able to quantify the progress that he was making. They have a curriculum that they follow that's tailored to each child. They were identifying AJ's strengths and weaknesses. We were finally starting to see real progress. Good, AJ. Here's eggs. The first thing CARD did for us was I remember the first time AJ said, Mommy, I want you. 
And that was the most wonderful thing ever. There's, so there's hope. Yeah, there's That's when I knew that there was hope. I never thought that AJ would be able to say that. It was like a gift from God. It was so fantastic. With Card, we got him enrolled in a private school. And he was in a typical classroom. He would go from activity to activity. He could sit when he was supposed to sit. He could be around typical kids. The goal is for Card to work themselves out of a job. It's for AJ to be in a mainstream classroom with no help, and he's functional and he's learning. We're really grateful to all of the therapists. AJ would not be where he is without them, and we will never be able to repay the part of themselves that they gave to him to make his life better and to make our lives better. Welcome back to Autism Live. We are in the studio with Evelyn Kung. She's the clinical director for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. She's fabulous. She's been working in this field for how long? More than 25 years. It's uh, hard to say now. I love how, how like, you know, like humble you are when you say that for like 25 years. <laughs> uh, as if that's not, a, that's a huge amount of time in helping a whole lot of people and helping a whole lot of families to achieve the things that they want to do. It's an amazing thing. I enjoy it. You know, well, it's so fun. And, and you're, like I said, you're a gift to this community. I'm moving on to the next question. Hi, I am the mother of a wonderful eight-year-old boy on the spectrum. He is high functioning and is in a mainstream classroom, but lately he's been having meltdowns at school due to an obsession he developed against another child. The other child started making faces at him uh, that he says scare him, but now it is to the point that he doesn't want to even see the other kid. He doesn't want him in his class or near him in any capacity. He is now throwing himself on the floor, having tantrums and crying. The school had talked to the other boy and addressed the face thing. They have rearranged the classroom to put separation between them with no change. This is the second time he has negatively obsessed with a classmate. Do you have any advice how to address this? What could be done to break the obsession to help him move on? Can ch changes be made at school? And thanks. Another, I gave you some tough ones today, Evelyn. This is, there's a lot of information that we don't know about this child. Absolutely. You know, and I think that that, please remember that when you're listening to this, yes. is there's just a whole range of skills that, you know, the spectrum is a spectrum. And so I'm, I can, with this one, I can give you kind of my best guess, you okay. know, assuming certain skills are available. And mom might be watching, so we could say to her that, you know, she, we always ask if you guys are watching, because this one came in like a week ago, um, so she may not be watching. But if you're watching and you hear something, you go, oh, I have something to add to that right in. Okay, so good. So I'm going to assume that this child actually can vocally communicate you know, can tell somebody when he's scared or, you know, doesn't want somebody near. And mm -hmm. so we're not guessing that that's what it is. Right. Um, that this child can actually say, no, I, that you can vocally tell that he's obsessing on this child. Okay. You know, whether positive or negative, we're going to yeah. assume that he's able to communicate and tell people, hey, I don't want that kid near me. He keeps looking at me. He didn't, you know, whatever it is that's bothering him. A lot of times the kids at that level, when they're very vocal, and they're in a school setting, um, usually if they're actually successful in a mainstream setting, that means they're usually pretty smart. They've got some really good skills, like they probably learned to decode early on where they could read or they know their numbers or they're good with math facts. And those kids, I always say, the minute I see a two or three year old with the ability to read when nobody's taught him or likes numbers and, or likes to count, I always say, oh, you're gonna be a really inflexible child. <laughs> Right? <laughs> You're really smart, but the reason you like, you know, how it's reading and numbers is because those things never change. You know, the way you spell apple is always A P P L E. But it never yeah, changes. I never thought about that before, but that there's a certain amount of control there. Yeah, and there's a certain amount of I like it this way. And a lot of our kids who do well, um, especially like in the early grades, kindergarten, first, second, when they're decoding and doing math facts, the first couple of years of school is very much just rote memory. And our kids, you know, on the spectrum, their rote memory cannot compete with any typical kid out there. <laughs> They're just so good at it, you yeah. know? They can just pick it up so easily. And so I would make that assumption about this kid, and that's why he's in that mainstream setting. Okay. Is that he actually has a lot of skills that makes it an appropriate place. Okay. So those kids that are, like, really like that routine 
have a really hard time socially because there are no specific rules that they can memorize. It always depends on, you know, well, a child could say this, but they can change their mind. <laughs> that makes our ASD kids nuts. Like, just the idea of thinking of you can change your mind. No, if you like something, you like it. You know, and because our kids, if they like Thomas the Train, they like Thomas the Train, and there's, they'll always like it to some degree. They're not going to switch their favorites. But a typical kid likes to switch their favorites. They like to, anything that's new and spontaneous mm. is good and better. And our kids are like, no, do not be spontaneous. Do not switch your preferences. Right. Do not, you know, they like everything to stay the same, and that's what makes them really happy. And a lot of typical kids out there, they get bored. They don't want things to stay the same way. They're going to keep trying new things. They're going to keep trying, you know, new pop culture. Um, they're going to try new interactions with friends. And sometimes with typical kids, making faces is a part of growing up. You make a face and every person reacts differently. Right. Every single person out there. So there are kids who in class will turn around and to every one of their classmates make a different face just to see what they're going to do. Right. They, they're looking for reactions. Yeah. And when they find one that's a They'll cool keep reaction, pursuing it. it's like a button yeah. that they keep pushing. I can make this face and you coming. totally react. Yeah. So I'm going to keep doing this because now I'm getting negative attention from you or some kind yeah. of attention that I normally don't get from anybody else. Right. And then they pursue it. And they're doing it because, oh, this is kind of interesting. And then if it's our kid that's on the other end of it, they're just like, stop, stop. Why are you doing this? You didn't do this before. You know, right. they don't like the spontaneity. They don't understand why this person is telling them. If they've been taught in ABA how to read faces, they're completely confused now. Because it's like, are you angry at me? Are you sad at me? If they're trying to read the face, right. are you scared? Like, what's going on? And they're trying to read it, and it keeps changing. That will, it makes things even worse. So there's been some kind of routine that's cr been established here. And so what your child has done essentially is, I can't control that, so I'm just going to try to control never having that child near me. Right. Because then now I've put my step in where if that child's never near me, I don't have to deal with what those faces mean, what I'm supposed to do in response to those faces, whether I'm supposed to ignore it or interpret it or whatever it is. Well, it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And wh why would any of us want to feel uncomfortable, right? I'm well, yeah, you, you're going to try to avoid any situation that makes you nervous right. or unsure. Right. You know, or if you lack confidence, and a lot of our kids do lack a lot of confidence. They, they're going to try to just get away from that situation where they're not sure of what's happening. That's great. And so now we have a little bit more handle on what, what might be going on. But as a mom, what do you do? Yeah, and so this is where you, it depends how long it's gone to. Yeah. Because you do have to work with the school. Yeah. You have to... Um, there's different ways. One is just to put them in a different classroom and you move on your merry way and then you'll just have to deal with situations like <coughs> assemblies or whatever where you just right. try to consciously um, increase the space between your child and another child. That's one way. And if you're in a small setting where that's impossible, if you live in a smaller town where everybody sees everybody all the time, yeah. um, then you might have to specifically address it. They've already talked to the other boy you know, so that's one step. It's like, you know what, when you do these things, you're trying to explain, you know, this child doesn't, didn't know what to do with it. And then after a while now is having a really hard time. Yeah. So you could go in and do some positive promotion where the child, you know, you're pairing something where the, if your child has some kind of preference and you give it to the other child right. and have that child give them the reinforcement for interacting, right. saying hi, keeping it really short, right? hi, here's something for you, and walking away, right. and trying to get some of that positive interaction going so that this child realizes it's different now. Yeah. Like I'm getting some reinforcement for interacting, yes. and then slowly building that interaction so that, and you're really, and this requires the other child to actually be very compliant though. Yes. If you have a child who's not compliant, this is very, very difficult to do because they might want nothing to do with this child. Right. All they know is they might feel like they just got in trouble right. for doing something that wouldn't have gotten them in trouble if they did it to someone else. And for this case, I'm wondering, as you're saying this, it's, it's towards the end of the school year that, I mean, you know, if there's a way to wait it out or move to another classroom, I know it feels weird at this point in the, in the year, but... The truth is, is now is the moment to move because there's very little left to be done. It's all that end of the year stuff where, you know, they're not, and this is an eight-year-old, they're not going to be doing finals. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But uh, so at this point in the year, part of me goes, get 
through it however you have to get through and make sure he's not in the classroom next year. Yeah. But as you said, that may not be, you know, if this happens in September or if you're in a place where there's only one classroom, then you might have to do all this and address it. But, yeah. but that sounds like a can of worms to me. It's really difficult. I've done it before. Yeah. I've done it where I've had to get a typical kid and it's working with the parents because then the parents kind of get really upset because they're like, why are you making my child do this? Right. And then that, there's a whole issue on that end. But I've, I mean, I've had to do this where, as the behavior analyst in the case, I'm shaping the behavior on all parties. Yeah. So it's the, par the child that right now is having a fit because it's like he's, he wants to stay away from that child and that control issue. Then I'm working with this typical child saying like, out of the goodness, like empathetic. <laughs> I'm gonna, you know, this, we want this to continue. And then talking to the parents and saying, can we do this with your child? Right. You know, this is a good goal for everyone. And that usually happens in smaller communities because you have to deal with it. Yeah. You can't just let that, you know, be pervasive. It's just, if you're in a small community and you're really, um, everybody has to get along and they're always going to be in the same class from here on out, yeah. then that is, you know, you have to actually work through it on all ends. And, you know, it works. You do. You yeah. get a good behavior analyst, break down everybody's behavior, put in reinforcement on all ends for everybody, <laughs> yeah. for you know, doing what they're supposed to do, breaking down steps. You can work through it, but you know, the, if you're in a larger community where you, just some distance is enough just to make that go away, yeah. then it works too. Because I'd be willing to bet, uh, just you know, I'm going to pretend I'm psychic for a minute, but having been a classroom teacher, I'm willing to bet that there's something going on with that other kid too. Yeah, um, that's true too. That, you know, whether it's just that and it might not be something bad. It might just be that he's one of seven kids. And so his attention bucket is a little less full than everybody else's, right? Yeah. Or uh, I found that in grade school, the kids that I had the hardest time because they would kind of devil my son were siblings of kids on the spectrum because they knew which buttons to push and they enjoyed <laughs> yeah. pushing them, right? And sometimes it's just as simple as that. But you know, so you've got, got a whole host of things there to look at, and it's the end of the school year. I'm going to hope and uh, pray for you that they don't, they don't have to be in the same classroom together next time. Uh, okay, we had a couple of questions that came in live that I, I want to see if we can get to. Uh, Dear Shannon, thank you so much for the show. What would be the appropriate school placement for a 15-year-old on the spectrum who has limited language to meet his needs, he's soft-natured, calm, sometimes hums constantly, and not at all grade level academically. Would homeschooling benefit? I'm in California and thanks again. Ah, oh, this is a bucket load and this is the big question of the hour. Is it? For the schools. Because that rate of autism, all those kids are in high school right now. Yeah. You know, it's that age. I mean, honestly, you have to look to see what y your child would be in a transition program. They would be getting a certificate, they wouldn't be on diploma track. And you have to look at the school to see, you know, is this transition appropriate for my child? One of the things I loved when I first learned how to write a transition IEP was I loved that there was a long-term goal for yeah. transition, and then I loved the different areas where you could do a yearly annual goal in different areas, and suddenly there were categories. My favorite is functional academics. It's like, yeah, I get to teach you numbers, but it's so that you can tell time so you know when to take your medication. Right. You know, it's just, there's a lot of skills that go into it. So you really want to see, like, what is, you know, this is where I tell parents, think about where your child is happiest, what they like doing, where, you know, what do I, what kind, uh, where do I see them after school is over? Mm -hmm. At 21, 22, where are they going to be? And, you know, all my business friends, like the business parents, I always say it's, let's use your business idea because you need to create something because in all respect in California and in a lot of places, the transition programs aren't set up adequately. Yeah. They don't have vocations that they immediately can transition your child into yeah. that's going to fit your child perfectly. Or even sometimes they don't even just have the job, the openings. Yeah. And so you really have to see what is your, look, go look at the transition, like what kind of job, you know, vocational offerings are they giving? Is it something that you're going to have to help create so that there is something appropriate for your child's interests and needs? You know, are you going to be the one? And right now it really is, I work with a lot of families, a lot of parents to talk about like where do they see their child after high school because it's important to plan it out. A lot of our kids, they're, you know, we teach them how to fit into high school, but the minute it's over and they don't have a placement to go to, 
they actually want to go back to school. Yeah. Like a lot of our kids here at CARD that have been here, that have always, um, they've learned to thrive on the structure of school. Yeah. They, when school is over, they want to go back to school and they ask. Yeah. They want to go back to school. They don't want to be couch potatoes. Yeah, they don't want, they want to be productive in one way or another and be able to participate. So whether you should homeschool or not, you look at the transition program because you're probably going to need help. Depends where you live. If you live in a smaller community, I always say, actually, even when you live in the city, if your child really want, likes to be in a certain place, I say go make friends with all the people that work in that place. Absolutely. <laughs> because if that might be a target goal or vocation for your child, you know, whether it's in a volunteer nature or in a paid nature, you know, if your child likes to be at the library or like one of my friends, her kids loves Jimmy John's. And I was like, go be friends. Because yes. let's get let's teach him how to do something, some kind of job there. Absolutely. And go befriend the manager and all the people who work there and get them to know him so that they realize that he's not a threat and that he wants to be somebody that wants they want to help. Right. And you know, you start facilitating it and then hopefully you can work with your transition program to possibly get him, you know, some kind of foot in the door to get yeah. access to that environment. But homeschooling I've also seen it work too. Sometimes, you know, especially if you get into big city schools, yeah. transition programs are too busy with too many kids and they're just overloaded. If you're homeschooled, I encourage you to always have a good social component. Yes. That child has cannot just get used to being home. Yeah. They have to be out in the community. They have to be integrated. They have to be a part of where you live. And you've taught them all these years to get along with people in school. And it doesn't mean um, homeschool programs, the dangers are that the kids get isolated. Absolutely. And their tendency already is to, already to isolate. So you really have to work really hard to get them out in the community, get them learning in the community, get them interacting, building relationships outside with people, you know, whether it's at a community center or at the park or at the zoo, you know, whatever it may be, at restaurants around town, libraries, you need to build those relationships. So if you do homeschool, you really have to intentionally put in all those social components so that your child doesn't become isolated and prefer isolation. Absolutely. Because so many of our children prefer isolation already, and you don't want that to happen because that will actually do what you were afraid of about, like, confining the parents to the house. Oh, confines everybody to the house and then then it's a terrible terrible thing we're pretty much out of time but i just want to say somebody wrote in and said hi shannon i love your so show so much do you know of any aba therapists or organizations that offer card services in london uk or that follow cards way of working thank you so much providing a lifeline to families especially here in the uk and and so we just want to give some resources to you the truth of the matter is is that i love that card has made it possible for absolutely anybody in the world to get access to the card way of looking at things it's just that there's sort of a good better best right and and obviously the the ideal choice would be to live near a center so that you could have your supervisor there and you could have the therapist there and you could bring your child to the center and have your clinics there and everybody be in the same room. That's, that's what everybody wants to strive for, but everybody doesn't have that yet. Um, so in places that don't have that, that yet, you, there is a couple of different models. There's telehealth, jump in whenever. Um, you, can, you have the ability to train your therapists um, using cards training uh, modules. Skills. Yep. Modules, IBT. IBT and using s cards curriculum skills. And it's very inexpensive to do those things together. The hard part is you have to train people and you have to maintain it and you have to figure out how to pay them and you become the administrator from it. But you would have all those card materials and you can even arrange to do telehealth and have a supervisor on Skype or something of that nature helping you to make sure that the program is designed the way that you want it. Um, we, we used to have an office in, in London. Really? I don't think I've, uh, since I've been here. Yeah, we had an office. I, 20 years ago, I used to travel, actually. I have a whole group of kids that uh -huh. I worked with that are probably 25 now. Wow. So we actually, I mean, I don't know how I would do this because I don't even know where the supervisors are. Yeah. But we had one or two that were trained in mm. England. And I don't know where they are at now, and they all became DCBAs. But you know, so, the, but, the thing yeah. is, is that when a parent gets motivated, every single place where CARD is now, there was a time when they weren't. And the reason why they're there now is because a parent got motivated and mm -hmm. said, I'm going to get this for my kid. 
and I'm going to do whatever it takes. And then another parent would hear and go, oh, can I go in on that with you and we'll work this out? And then another parent and then another parent until they got to like 10 mm -hmm. and then an office opened. So I'm, I'm going to tell you, you can make it happen. Yeah, you can definitely make it happen. Um, we have several sites overseas that are run by parents. You know, where they get a whole group of parents together and they form a school or they form an academy or they can, the parents have gotten together to do it. And what we do is we'll just provide the training, they use skills, but it's run by people who live there. Because what we found is that it's most effective. If your BCBA lives near you, if the, you know, everything near you is what's going to be helpful, but we can provide all the training, the curriculum, guidance for you if you find somebody who's willing to take that guidance. So there you go. <laughs> uh, I, I know I feel bad sending it back to you, but I'm telling you it's possible. It's just a matter of how bad do you want it? Because mm -hmm. uh, somebody's going to want it bad enough to do it eventually. Is it, is it you? Is it you? <laughs> no pressure.